Okay, uh, welcome back. It's uh, now my pleasure to introduce today keynote's uh, speaker, uh, Nadia Pisanti. Um, Nadia Pisanti received her PhD in uh, computer science uh, in uh, uh, 2002. Uh, from the University of Pisa in Italy, where she is currently associate professor. Um, she has uh, worked or have been long last uh, uh, visiting scientist at uh, uh, several institutions across Europe, uh, especially in France at uh, INRIA, um, CNRS, uh, and um, several institutes in Paris, the Pasteur Institute, Paris East, Paris North, and then in the Netherlands, uh, Leiden University, CWI Amsterdam, and uh, also in other um, institutions like King College London and the Academy of Science uh, in Budapest. Um, a research activity is uh, mainly on uh, the design of algorithms uh, for the analysis of genomic and transcriptomics uh, data. Um, Oh, with uh, um, uh, particular also interest in uh, combinatorial aspects and computational uh, complexity. Um, she uh, co-authored more than 100 publications, uh, considering journals, uh, conferences, books, uh, uh, as well as uh, several software tools. Uh, she's been in the program committee of about 90 international conferences, uh, five of which uh, she, uh, she chaired. And uh, she is currently in the editorial board of two uh, international journals. Um, she um, has uh, also joined us or joined several national and international projects on algorithms and bioinformatics uh, research. Uh, she currently leads an Italian project and uh, uh, joins the European International Training Network Alpaca project on computational pangenomics. Um, computational pangenomics uh, um, has been a, a kind of popular topic this year at uh, uh, RecompSeq. Uh, we learned yesterday from uh, Ben Langmid uh, keynote talk about fighting reference bias uh, um, with pangenomic methods. And we will have a contributed uh, uh, paper uh, session later on after uh, uh, the break. But uh, for now, we are all uh, curious to learn more from uh, Nadia about uh, read mapping on pangenomes with the generate text. So Nadia, welcome to ReComSec. And thanks, uh, uh, thanks I Gina. give thank you the you word. Very nice introduction. Yeah, and, and I want to, to thank also uh, both Chinti and Laila for organizing this nice edition of ReComSec and for inviting me for, of course, I'm going to share my screen. Let me pick this one. So can you see my slide? Yes. Uh, do I have a way to use a pointer? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, um, but I cannot see uh, pointers. Do you see my oh, mouse? Oh yeah, the, the mouse, yeah. Okay, oh. that's, that's enough, I would say. Okay. So yeah, the title that my talk, uh, Chinti already mentioned it is, uh, Read mapping on pangenomes with the generated text. Okay, so uh, I go straight to uh, the intuition of the problem. Okay, uh, the, the generated text is the one you see below there is this X uh, tilde string, where basically the intention is to uh, represent actually a set of uh, related genomes where you collapse uh, common. Uh, text in a normal linear string. And whenever you have a variation, okay, that's uh, the right word indeed, uh, you open uh, uh, brackets and you, you list all the options. Okay, So then again, you have this uh, shared uh, GG and then you have again a list of options. In particular here, you see you have 
a choice between TA, 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 G, and the empty string. So actually, uh, in this general case of what we call elastic, the general string, the choice can be among strings that can have different size and can include uh, the empty string, okay? So the problem we address basically, even if I will do a bit of a zoom out at a certain point, is that of doing pattern matching where the pattern is a linear string like this one, and the text is a, an elastic degenerate text, okay? So for example, here you see an occurrence of this pattern C, G, 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 T, A, T, A, as the red uh, letters in this degenerate text. Okay, so this is now outline of my talk. I will first give an intuition of uh, why the degenerate text can be used to represent a pangenome, okay? And then I will describe uh, the problem of doing pattern matching on such text, exact and approximate and uh, some side results like uh, using bit vector under certain condition using multiple partner partners and uh, uh, some other practical uh, solutions and then i um, i describe a work where instead of doing pattern matching with a uh, linear pattern and a needed text we try to compare two degenerate text and here we need to restrict to uh, non-elastic, just a generic string. I will tell you later what this means. And for this problem, there is a tiny application to uh, palindromic decomposition of the generic text. And then I will describe briefly some theoretical, but rele very relevant for the problem, from the theoretical point of view, uh, um, some, uh, let's say, history or more recent history of this problem where uh, the original algorithm we uh, presented a couple of years ago was first improved by some some colleagues and then improved by me and other co-author uh, showing also some lower bound okay so first uh, part i want to introduce the problem, and in particular, the representation of a pangenome uh, with a degenerate text. So this is uh, a paper I, I had the chance to co-author with uh, many colleagues. Uh, we we're, were about 50, I think. Uh, the, the name we gave us was the Computational Pangenomic Consortium. Um, and it's uh, what you can call it a white paper on computational pangenomics. Here we list uh, the challenges of computational pangenomics. What are the uh, expectation one could have from this topic? What are the more challenging uh, applications? What are the main uh, issues, theoretical and practical, from many point of view? Okay, of computer science, the data structure, the algorithmic, the representation, the uh, database and so on. And also from the application point of view, there is there are discussions over cancer, pangenomics and other relevant biomedical applications. So this is somehow the paper that opened up this nice uh, community that uh, actually joined uh, at least at the European level in a couple of uh, European project uh, Cinzia just mentioned this one, which is a training program, which is starting this year. Uh, it's called Alpaca. Um, and I'm part of the consortium of this project. And another uh, important project on computational pangenomics that I'm, I'm not joining at the moment is the Pangaia, which is instead a RISE consortium, which is uh, exchanging visits between partners. So many of the people in this project, uh, there is a big intersection between the two projects and many of the people therein are author of this paper. That's why I introduced them all together. And many of them are in the audience, if I'm not wrong. So the, the, for those uh, who cannot guess it yet, let me describe a second what we mean for pangenome and why there is uh, an interesting issue with uh, elastic degenerate text with pangenome. So the definition of pangenome you can find on Wikipedia is this. 
The pan genome describes the full complement of genes which can have large variation in gene content among closely related strains. The definition we wrote on the white paper, which took us, I don't know, one, two hours discussion, very interesting, is a collection of genomic sequences to be analyzed jointly or to be used as a reference. And here comes explicitly the, the reference, the term reference, because basically one of the main issue, the, one of the, how to say, more direct need of uh, um, so-called pangenome is that of replacing the traditional linear reference used for many biomedical applications with uh, something that is more structured that represents also variants and so a pangenome as a, a new type of more complex, more, um, how to say, describing more information uh, uh, reference. So traditionally, as I said, the reference genome is a single uh, genome, okay, or uh, a real one or an artifact built as a consensus. Uh, but yeah, it can be interesting to actually use the actual information we have, which is several related genomes, for example, uh, uh, a family, a trio or so, a subpopulation, and then use that as a reference. How do you do this? Well, you will have to do an alignment of these uh, related genomes, collapse together. Common fragments highlight the differences, the variants, and somehow represent this all together. Okay, and then when you have such reference, a very basic problem you will have to uh, solve therein for many tasks. Okay, even for uh, for let's say both if you want to do downstream analysis after you sequence a new individual, you have the reads you want to map on the reference, or if you want to do many other tasks, okay? It's important, the basic, uh, the basic, to solve the basic problem of you have your uh, pan genome, you have your pattern, your read, okay, linear string, you want to map to find occurrences of your pattern in the pan genome, okay? So this is basically the, the main uh, motivation we have for this problem. So uh, this is what used to be the reference genome, a linear, and now the suggestion is to use instead a pan genome, and then what you want to do, rip mapping, solving actually this problem I described at the beginning of the talk. <coughs> so uh, more formally, I want to introduce now what is an elastic degenerate string. The idea is that you have uh, several individuals, okay, with somehow related organs up in two individuals from the same family, from the same subpopulation. You align your genomes and then you highlight common strings and uh, variants. And uh, a way, a natural way to represent this, introduced uh, almost 10 years ago, is the, the string uh, you see below, okay? So I insist that the genets, so I repeat, uh, I introduced a bit earlier on, but I repeat it. A degenerate string is when you have something where whenever you have a variant, the strings are bound to have the same length, like in this first AC or this other one, G or T. Uh, this would be just a degenerate string. We talk about elastic degenerate string when you have also variants where the size of the string among which you can choose can uh, change. Okay, this is basically corresponds to the well-known standard format uh, for describing the variants, the DCF file. So in particular for the elastic degenerate string, we use the following notation with uh, the note with small n, the length of the string, which is the number of uh, these sets. So this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay? It's the length of the string. And we use big N, to describe instead the total size of the string, which counts the letters. Okay, so this AC are counted twice, even if they are on the same position, the empty string is counted as well. And in particular for this string in the example, the total size is 24, okay? So uh, 
Again, we talk simply about this string, which were first uh, described in a paper in the LATA conference by some colleagues from King's College. You have that all the string in the degenerate positions are bound to have the same size. This is a special case. A special case of this special case is when we have a single letter. This is just correspond to you to have a linear string on a degenerate alphabet. Which is another setting. So a bit of literature in the in the string, let's say, in bioinformatic, uh, more on the theoretical side. Uh, literature is this. There are, up to 2017, there was uh, quite a lot. Okay, uh, on uh, how to uh, represent in an efficient way a set of uh, related strings. Okay. Uh, these are some of the possible results, and most of this work uh, listed here uh, concerns the issue of uh, representing indexing such string. So these uh, these papers, uh, whenever you you want to eventually do pattern matching, uh, suggest ways to do it uh, in a so-called uh, offline manner, meaning that you build an index of the degenerate text, and then you can serve queries of pattern matching in, in a very quick time, okay? Uh, this is uh, some more, the specifically here, they talk about a lot, specifically address the problem of doing alignment of pattern matching on the generate text or, or, or other uh, similar structure like string uh, tree on the variation graph structure that represent basically the same information as the, the string. So, but uh, what we want to suggest is something different. We want to do, uh, what we call simply online pattern matching, meaning that you don't assume you have the whole string in memory at the same time, okay? You actually have the text somewhat, but you process it uh, letter by letter, position by position, okay? Whether this is a, a linear uh, letter, so the, one, the, the positions where you collapse or the similar string into a single uh, linear string or whether you have a variant, so you have a choice. Anyway, you, you, the idea with online uh, pattern matching is to analyze the sequence uh, one position at a time, okay? So this is the setting, I mean. So the next uh, part is to uh, describe what are what is the problem that we call EDSM, elastic degenerate string matching. I hope I convinced you that you can represent with ED string pangenomes, at least uh, some specific pangenomes. So in particular where the related genomes are really closely related, okay. Uh, we will discuss at the end of the talk a bit uh, what are the uh, type of variant you can represent with the string and what you can't represent with the string. So, and then I want to uh, show our approach. So our EDSM uh, problem setting and solutions for doing uh, what in, in a biological application side is the read mapping on a pan genome where the read is a linear string and the pan genome is an elastic degenerate string. So I will start with the exact version of the pattern matching. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say that here on the right, the column uh, is uh, some references uh, that of the total work uh, I will uh, describe in this in this in this talk, and uh, the one underlined are paper where I am co-author, and the other are not. Okay, so uh, why online? Okay, why, why do, did we choose to work online? The motivation is basically, as you know, okay, that uh, a elastic degenerate text, the pangenum or the D text, the degenerate text only, can be very, very long. Okay, and in particular, it's much, much longer than the pattern. You will have to seek the read. You will look for occurrences. So the idea is that uh, rather than pre-processing uh, the all in indexing the old text and querying the single pattern uh, 
every time we basically uh, have our pattern, which eventually we pre-process the pattern in the end. And then we uh, process the string in a sort of streaming way, okay? Position by position without keeping it all in memory. So the problem formally is this, in input we have a string P, the pattern of length M, an elastogenic string T tilde of length N and total size big N. Then what we want to look for are all the positions in the text where an occurrence of P ends, okay? So we will report the last, the end of the occurrence. So again, an example, this is a pattern with the length uh, eight, okay, and this is a possible occurrence. In this case, we would output three, which is the last position. Positions are zero, one, two, three, where, and it's where the occurrence of P ends. So uh, let's go a bit deeper to describe what is in particular, how, how we can decompose the, uh, the occurrence of a pattern. If you have an occurrence of a pattern like that, what happens is that there is a beginning of your pattern, which will in general be a prefix of your pattern, which we call P0, okay, the first module, which matches somewhat a suffix of any degenerate uh, letter, okay? Then you uh, will have to extend this prefix P0 with uh, other uh, components, okay, which we call from P1 and so on, uh, which will have to be uh, until, uh, before you reach the last part, okay, will have to be entirely covering a position of the last general text, and these are fragments of your pattern, okay? like this G and this GG, and then you will have a final part, which will be in general, the suffix of your pattern, you know, the last block, PM minus one, and uh, this will have to match in general, a prefix of a position of the pattern. Okay, so this just to say how it is built the, the match, okay? So what we do in our online setting, basically is in all these options, beginning of an occurrence, extending a previously started occurrence or possibly closing it, okay? In every position of the last intelligent test, we check, we, we process data in order to check uh, whether we are uh, detecting any of these. So in particular, in a generic situation, you have your text, which is streaming and you are, taking care of uh, position I, okay? So you are processing position I when you get into this stage, what you know is that you have done a step, the previous step, so after step I minus one, that's the, the situation. And after step minus one, what you know about your pattern and your text is that there are uh, some possible occurrences of your pattern prefixes so far of your pattern up to here, okay? And then you will have to check whether this can be extended or the, if there are new ones that start. And if you extend uh, something, whether you finish an occurrence. And this can be all represented by, simply by a Boolean vector. For example, this one, the Boolean vector should be as long as the pattern. So in this case, it's 14 from zero to 13. And you place a one, Okay, for example, you have a one at position three, which represents the prefix AGAT, because you have an occurrence of AGAT, which first ends at position I minus one, okay? So you have a one year with prefix A, because you have an occurrence that starts with A, that ends with the end of position I minus one, and so on, okay? So what you have at the beginning of uh, entering uh, position I of your pattern, you have all the prefixes that are active, that's how we call it, for the pattern, you want to try to extend this, okay? So what you seek after the end of the step is to fill in the new vector, which you will fit with, with the next step, uh, I plus one, where you have the, the, the active prefixes after step I, okay? So in particular, how do we proceed? We have that this position one corresponds to having letter A, which is a possible beginning of an occurrence of P, and you want to try to extend 
extend, you will need to find GAT, blah, blah, and you, there's no GAT in our current position I, so this will end up with no extension. So this Boolean one there will, will die, okay? Will not be propagated. Then you try with this one, and this is there because you have a GAT somewhat ending at position I minus one, you want to stand it with AC, AC, and then you can do that just picking this A and you stand by one letter. And so that's why you place the one in this position, one step further, okay? And so on, you do this for every active prefix. For example, the active prefix ending with the ACACA can be extended uh, possibly with something that starts with CAT, which is of length three, so three steps away, you place a one and so on, okay? This also is hopeless. And then uh, uh, after step i, you have a standard all partial matches from step i minus one uh, to fit, okay, with this new Boolean vector, the next uh, uh, text position. You will also have to check whether there are new occurrences of the pattern that start here. So the pattern starts with a, g, a, t. So what you do is to say, okay, this is, there's an a, so I can put a one here because A is an active prefix now, okay? Also, there is uh, A, G, A, T. So you, you consider other possible prefixes and there are not, and then you stop, okay? So this is the final uh, Boolean vector you, you have after step I, okay? So we call the for future uh, reference this, this two uh, Boolean vector U and V, the one entering U and the one output is V. And then when you have done, you have finished processing this position, you just have to check whether you put a one in the last letter, because if you did, then there is an occurrence of the wood pattern ending there. In this case, there's not, okay? So basically what we do after each step, we check whether new occurrences start where the old uh, active preface can be extended and whether any of them is ending there, okay? This is a whole text example uh, very quickly. I start with uh, position zero, which is this of the text. There's no prefix that matches there or, and then you start with zero, 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 okay? Then you go to the next. You, can, you have A, which is a possible beginning of the pattern and nothing else. So you have this uh, Boolean vector and then step two, which is this one, uh, you have uh, some possible extension. So you finish with this Boolean vector and you detect the one in the last position. And indeed, there is an occurrence of AC, ACA that ends at, at this uh, position two, which is A, C, A, C, A, and you will have to output this, okay? And so on. And then in the end, uh, there will be another occurrence ending uh, at position four, which is this one, which is this A, C, A, C, A, okay? Okay, that's it. So uh, what are the tools we use to, to complete these steps? Well, basically we build at the beginning a suffix tree of the pattern and the border table of the pattern. And this will allow us to, to serve these queries about extending at the prefix in a relatively quick time, okay? We will see why it's a relative because the algorithm describing now, which was we introduced in CPM 2017, paper was actually a year later improved slightly. So basically what we do is in a time which is proportional to the length of the, the general string, we build the border table of the pattern together with the strings of the, the generate position. This allows us to do in this time, the update of the Boolean vector, okay? Uh, in the special case I didn't mention, but let's do it now in which you have a string in the degenerate position, which is longer than the pattern. We will have to just check whether the wool pattern occurs in any of that string. In that case, you can start wherever in the string and then wherever. It doesn't have to be falsely prefix of a suffix. And then we use any a linear algorithm with 
having preprocessed pattern, like for example, the Knut Morris Pratt one. So this is basically then the computational problem we solved and the final outcome is this running time, was this running time, which is nm square, length of the text, length of the pattern, which is much less than n uh, square plus the total size of the of the text of the the generate text okay and the space is just that of the pattern because we work online in a streaming way with the text so what happened uh, uh, oh okay sorry there is also this bit vector version i want to mention together in the same paper we introduce also a bit vector version of this uh, of this very same EDSM argument, where basically everything is done on bit vector, assuming that the, in particular the pattern, because we work with bit vector of the size of the pattern, is not larger than the word machine, we can assume this, okay, and then we have this overall complexity, just working with uh, bit vector instead of uh, uh, strings. So very quickly, all the steps I described uh, so far, okay. Checking whether there's an occurrence starting in a certain position, extending partial occurrences, or check whether something is ending or an entire string of core, the entire pattern of course in the string. Everything can be done just with bit vector with the shift uh, uh, or exclusive or I'm, I'm sparing the details, but the, the, the very same problem active prefix can be all solved with operation on Boolean pattern. This is speed up, okay? You will you can ignore in that case the length of the of the basically the length of the pattern is uh, covered by the word uh, the word length in the RAM model. Okay, I, I will just keep the details. Go on. Okay. Okay, so these are some experimental uh, results of that time. And the, what you can see are actually the, com is the comparison of three tools. One is, was the best before our CPM paper, which was another conference paper of the same year is the red. Our algorithm EDSM is the green and the big vector is the blue, okay. So you can see in, uh, with the length we assume for the pattern, we, we could also use effectively the bit vector. So this is the one bitting. And uh, the, you see in um, the running time all over, it's uh, all in logarithmic scale. Well, you see that basically our ETSM performs much better than the previous work and a bit worse in these cases than the bit vector version of the very same algorithm. So this is another experiment showing that basically the complexity is always linear with respect to the total size n of the of the string, of the degenerate string. So basically you cannot go below that. Okay. So let me mention now the approximate uh, solutions which use basically the same algorithmic setting but different toolkits to to check whether you can extend or start a new occurrences. Basically, we have two uh, different uh, variations of the problem. We consider, we consider errors uh, that are just substitutions. So basically, yeah, the problem is to find, given an elastic degenerate text and the pattern, the occurrence of the pattern with up to a certain Hamming distance, so up to a certain number of mismatches. And the other setting is the one where you also admit insertion and deletion. So the setting is that of the edit distance. So basically the problem we address are these two. I'm not going to, into the detail, but just tell you the final result. In the case of M in distance, <coughs> if you want to find occurrence of, the, of, the, of a pattern with up to k errors, where errors are the I mean distance, we have this complexity. We have the size of the pattern multiplied, not surprisingly, by the number of possible errors. 
also the total size big N is multiplied by the number of errors. And there is, instead of the N uh, M that was used to be in this case, the M was square and the N was here. We have this G, which is the total number of strings. So you count one, the linear string, and you count as many lines as you have in the degenerate position. For the case of very distant, not surprising, the K becomes square in this case, because of course, with the insertion and deletions allowed, we have more branching in the, in the <coughs> solution, space solution, you have to check. So basically, as I introduced, the framework of the algorithm is always the, the EDSM, the very same structure, but basically at each step, you will have to use different toolkits. For example, in the case of the Hamming distance, when you want to check whether a prefix of the pattern matches a suffix of any of the strings, so whether a new occurrence is starting, then instead of using the border table as we did in the exact case, we use the uh, augmented generalized suffix tree, which will allow us to, to serve longest common extension queries in constant time. And in this way, we check whether we can extend the pattern up to the next errors. And we have a countdown for the errors we can still spend. So this is basically the idea. <clears throat> for the case of added distance, uh, I spare you the details of, uh, details of an example. But as you can imagine, the number of uh, occurrences grows a lot, okay? Because we have more choices. And basically here, uh, again, we use the augmented generalized suffix tree. And again, we use the longest common extension, but in practice, what we do for, for every degenerate position, we are doing a, a, a computing at the distance using a dynamic programming table. In particular, we adapt the landau Viskin algorithm for when we build a new DP table for every position. Okay, so this big vector variation I explained to you earlier, I explained, I mentioned to you earlier on, was uh, the year later, our CPM paper uh, extended by Solon Pieces and one of his students to deal with multiple patterns. So instead of having a single pattern P, you have a set of strings, which, is, which has total size big M, okay? And you want to find occurrences of any of the patterns, okay? And, and they do it by extending the bit vector, the method, the very same method we used in the, in the previous, in the EDSM paper. So this just com for com completeness, I wanted to mention this paper. If you uh, see what is their uh, complexity, the running time is the same, basically. If you go down to small m, single string, as we, we have for the single uh, pattern and the search time is the same, okay? If you go down to a single string, you have exactly the same occurrence as we used to have, the same complexity. So yet another side result of our EDSM is this paper by Jan Holub and one of his students is basically a, an implement the same algorithms here, which was independently conceived and uh, an implementation uh, on some practical uh, uh, example. The, there is a simplification because they don't use the suffix tree, but they work a bit worse for short pattern, a bit bet better for long pattern, but it's basically almost the same uh, algorithm. It's a short paper on bioinformatics. So now I want to jump a bit to a related problem before uh, going back to EDSM, uh, which is that instead of uh, mapping uh, a, a pattern, a linear pattern on a degenerate text, this is just picking two degenerate texts and comparing. Comparing in particular, trying to check whether there is a match between two degenerate texts. So this was a work we had in uh, Wabi, uh, two years ago and which was published uh, very recently, actually a few months ago in its journal version, extended journal version. So the idea is this, uh, I want to match two degenerate texts and the, the first problem we had to address here was to 
define what we mean with matching to the general test. So in particular, what we, uh, the, the question we wanted to answer was, I have two degenerate texts. I want to some to do something with that. Whatever I want to compare their. Um, I want to see how many substrings they share. I want to see whether one is the reverse of the other one. I want to see whether uh, they are the same. Okay. Whatever you want to do with the general text, you have to answer the single question of given two fragments of the general text. Are these the same? Uh, do they represent the same string or among all the strings they represent, is there a non-empty intersection? This is basically the, the, the simple question we wanted to answer. So what we end up with was this. We first gave a definition, which I will now share with you of a, a match between two D strings, okay? And uh, <clears throat> while doing this work, we realized we, this was very strongly related to to some uh, basic automata problems because in the end the general text uh, uh, is just a very simple uh, DAG. <laughs> and then we conceived a, a linear algorithm, not trivial, but uh, uh, quite natural, I must say, that uh, of linear uh, complexity that tells, given to the general string, tells whether they do match, okay? So, and then we made, uh, up, we actually encoded our algorithm and we applied to some, uh, a real problem, which is the D string represents uh, RNA, a set of uh, RNA and find in particular, we use the basic problem we solved of checking whether two strings are the same to be able to answer whether a certain D string uh, has a palindrome, okay? So if you think of it to check whether a string is a palindrome, uh, uh, you have to, in particular, check whether two strings are the same at a certain point under certain condition. In the case of the palindrome in the reverse order, one of the two halves, okay? And then uh, we extend this, ability to, to check whether a D string is a palindrome to finding uh, all the set of palindromes, maximal palindromes in a string, in a degenerate string. So the definition of uh, what is a match is the following. We very simply, if you pick a degenerate uh, string like this one, you can see the set of strings it uh, implicitly represent as a language, okay? So for example, you view the string X cap with, uh, as the list of all the possible strings it represents, which is always starting with CGTA, CG, and then uh, you pick in one case ATT, in the other case CGA, and so all the combinations, okay? And then you have a list of strings. So call this the language generated by the string. And then if you pick another string, why, okay, the question we want to answer is simply whether in the two languages there is an unnapped intersection between the two languages. So in particular, in this example, you have the string uh, I underlined in light blue, which is share, but it, these two strings. So in, the, in this case, these two strings do match, okay? So uh, some observation to uh, the genetic string, non-elastic, so there's no difference in the size of the string you can read, okay? Can only match if they have the same width. So if they're the same uh, from left to right, you always read the same number of letters in the two of them, okay? So this is a requirement. In particular, in this example, it's 20. Another observation uh, we make is that you can see the language, uh, of any string, the genetic string, as the Cartesian product of that of every single degenerate letter. So in this case is C, G, T, A, C, G, concatenated with uh, any of these, concatenated with this, concatenated with, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So if you pick, for example, the language of this single uh, position, the first one in red, ATT or CGA, blah, 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 Basically, you can make the Cartesian product of all the languages and you obtain that of the string. And this can be uh, used in the, in the 
problem we solve or checking whether two strings share in the language something because we observe that if you have, um, you must have two strings of the same uh, width, okay? And then the, you, you, we made this basic observation. If these two strings share something, okay? So if they have the same length, and in total, and there is a prefix of both that have the same length. So in particular, this first part of X, which is X1, has a certain length, in this case, it's 17, okay? And there is a prefix of X, uh, of Y, which has this also length 17. So length means that there is a closed parenthesis bracket somewhere, somehow, that ends can be aligned with the other one. So for example, the total width is uh, 20 for both here. And there is a last fragment, which is length one plus length two. So total three, and this is one entire of length three. This means that you can decompose the problem of checking whether these two share uh, a string, okay? Into the problem of checking whether the first, the light blue on the line, shares a string and the second. So you can actually go down to uh, the assumption that there are no such prefixes that are aligned, okay? And so we go down to, a, let's say, a simpler problem, just applying the Cartesian product of what we call here the outcome in the synchronized prefix. So, uh, in this way, we are left, as I said, with the problem of assuming that there are no synchronized prefix, and then we just have to somehow align uh, part of one of the two string with something which falls in the middle of a degenerate position of the other one, which we uh, represent in this way. For example, see here, these two strings R and S, you have the, pos the shortest beginning is the one of S because it has with only one, okay? And this A can be aligned, for example, with the beginning of these two strings. Uh, when you have aligned this, what you are, you are left is you have finished processing this first degenerate letter of S, and you're left with trying with extending only with these two prefixes, which are those where there is an A starting. So in other words, with the, 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 the notation we gave us, we uh, call R0, R1, R2, the, the, the several, uh, the su subsequent uh, positions of R and S0, S1, et cetera, those of S. And uh, we start with the shortest and we call CHOP the uh, letters that match the beginning of something in the other one, okay? And when you have a chopped this A, okay, we call the optic prefix is what is left in this case is GCCG and the GTC in the one where you have chopped something because it, there was a partial match. Okay, so you do this basically at each step, finishing uh, one of the two, one letter of one of two strings and chopping from the other one. And, and you proceed step by step, again in an online manner, and again in uh, <coughs> linear time. So I, I spare you the, the details of all the steps, but in this case, you end up basically decomposing the problem uh, and proceeding without stepping back on your path, and then it's a linear time algorithm. We apply this, as I said, to checking whether there are two strings are these strings are palindrome, and in particular also to find substrings sub of a string which is a palindrome and common palindromes between two different substrings. And this is the problem we solved uh, next. Um, very quickly, the palindrome we admit in this string are palindrome that's, let's, let's say, the we call a palindrome something which starts and ends uh, outside of the bracket. So you cannot finish a substring and call it palindrome if you are inside a position. So for example, AGGGA here is a palindrome, okay? Because it starts at the beginning of a degenerate position, it ends at the end of a degenerate position, and it is a palindrome string. 
TGT would be a palindrome string, but it's not a palindrome in this string because TG starts in the middle of a position. <coughs> so uh, after this definition, it's quite clear that you, the total number of palindromes you can have in this string is limited. You can limit it in two ways. You can limit checking the number of pairs that can be the beginning at the end of a substring, uh, which can be or not palindrome, or the number of possible centers. The number of possible centers are the number of all the total width of the string. So it's W. And the number of possible uh, pairs starting and ending is instead N squared, because N is the number of all these brackets uh, opening and closing. <clears throat> Sorry. So actually for assuming these two bounds, we, we then do a very simple uh, algorithm which tries for all possible center or, or for all possible pairs of boundaries to find whether there are palindromes in the string. So next thing I want to tell you is uh, in, in a speed up that was done for EDSM a year later, our algorithm, and then some uh, um, update we did over this. Very recently, actually, the, the, this work I will describe next is of ICALP of two years ago, but we have an extended version, which is being now revised in a journal uh, or submission. So very quickly, uh, I recall that the, our CPM 2017 solution for ADSM at this complexity, at that time complexity. Um, a year later, uh, Hide Banai and other colleagues from Tokyo improved this algorithm. Just going down from M square, this uh, piece of work, to M to the 1.5 square root of log N. Okay, so this was an improvement using some uh, string uh, toolkit, okay? Very smart improvement. But um, then <clears throat> with other colleagues, uh, we had the question, can this be improved uh, further? What, and then to tell you what's the story, I will briefly describe what the improvement is. You recall that one uh, crucial step of uh, our EDSM was to solve what we call the active prefix problem, which is you have the prefix active after step i minus one. You want to find those that are active after step i. Okay, so this is the, the, the sub problem we solved. The active prefix, which can be stated separately in this way. It's somewhat interesting on its own. Actually what uh, in CPM in 2018 improvement was done was to improve this the solution to this sub problem. Okay, then came to us the, the natural question, can we improve further this, uh, this EDSM uh, complexity? And can this be done improving even more the active prefix or, or not? But this was the questions, the theoretical questions we first of all posed to us. And then the questions uh, uh, came in this uh, work Basically, we prove that assuming the SEP hypothesis, which is a bit uh, tricky from the theoretical computer science point of view, and maybe not all of you are familiar with this, but the idea is this, you take the Boolean matrix multiplication problem and actually also the related one triangle uh, detection. Uh, and there is a conjecture that tells that there there's no subcubic algorithm to solve this problem. Okay, so this is a quite uh, uh, assumed claim. Okay, and then we prove that if the AP problem should it be solved in less than m to the 1.5, so disregarding logarithmic factor, this means improving the CPM 2018 um, solution of the Japanese colleagues, then we would have actually we would confute this conjecture, okay? We would, would the assumption uh, would be uh, false. So 
this is somehow a claim that it cannot be, we cannot improve AP further, okay? Then we have this lower bound for AP, basically. So for the way the DSM framework works, it, it tells us that if you have this complexity for AP, then you have this complexity for the elastic degenerate string matching problem. So if you cannot solve AP faster than this, this means, this implies that you cannot solve with AP EDSM faster than NM to the 1.5 plus M. Okay, so this would tell that, for example, the uh, argument of the Japanese colleague cannot be improved. But then uh, you may wonder well, who tells us that the only way, the best way to solve EDSM is through solving AP. Okay, so this is basically another natural question, which we also solved using, a, as I said, a related problem of triangle detection for which there is basically a similar conjecture okay, that cannot be solved in less than cubic time. We prove a lower bound for the, a direct lower bound for EDSM. So EDSM with or without the active prefix uh, solution as a sub, uh, part of the problem of the, of the algorithm cannot be solved in less than this time, okay? It cannot be so, solved in less than n times m to the 1.5 plus big N. So this is a lower bound for the elastic degenerate string matching. And this is a lower bound using combinatorial algorithm because the uh, assumption, the, what we proved is that you cannot solve in less than this, okay? using a combinatorial algorithm because you cannot, otherwise you would be able to solve the triangle detection, the Boolean matrix in less than cubic time with a combinatorial algorithm. But then we, uh, using basically the same reduction we have from the, this algebraic uh, problems, okay? That can be solved efficient, more efficiently with non-combinatorial but algebraic solution. We uh, exhibit a, a solution for a DSM with this complexity, which you does not use combinatorial algorithm, but algebraic methods, okay? So we um, transform our problem in one uh, with the Boolean matrix multiplication. We apply the algebraic method, which has complexity, which is subcubic in this case, and then we go back, okay, using some other, I'll spare you the details and above all, I'll spare you the reduction because it's very complex. And uh, we split into several cases of string periodicity of the string and the general position. We use the fast Fourier transform. And actually the, the strength of this work uh, is actually the way we combine uh, uh, these mathematical algebraic tools and string algorithmic toolkits and problems we solve. So this was the final result. So the, the, in this way, I wanted to tell you this result because this closes somehow the picture of the DSM problem complexity. Uh, we have in CPM 2017, this solution, this was improved a year later and this was closed up with algebraic method and it cannot be done better than this with combinatorial method. So the question, can this improve further or with or without AP was answered by the two lower bounds okay, we gave. Cannot improve further and you cannot with or without AP. Okay, so a few more, I have two minutes now. I wish I had more because there comes some part which maybe is more interesting for you. On the practical side, there has been uh, some work in the last uh, few years they try to suggest ways to represent the pan genomes. So for example, there is this work where it was introduced somehow, one of the first data structure to introduce a reference graph instead of reference string. So representing multiple reference string. Then there was this very nice uh, analysis of uh, Peyton and other colleagues from which I steal also this figure, which I will reuse in a second, which is another suggestion here so to represent a collection of human genome. In particular, this, this paper focuses on human genome. 
Then there comes this other one, some tools that use this data structure to solve some problem. For example, this graph typer. But basically, uh, this, this other paper that uses the so-called variation graph is a bit improving previous work, at least at that time in 2018, in terms of uh, scalability or uh, the topological constraint you have on the graph, which correspond to the variation you represent. And talking about this, I want to focus a second uh, on some of, uh, this is another one, be great, is a, a suite uh, of tools that work in particular in this case on the pan genome, which is represented in a De Bruyne graph. So I wanted to um, share with you some observation. Uh, this is a figure stolen uh, without asking permission uh, from the paper of uh, Benedict uh, and others of 2017, where they represent the uh, aligned sequence with these uh, natural colors, okay? And then they represent the genome graph as something where, for example, here you have the uh, description of the fact that the green or brown are alternative. And uh, they can also not be there with these uh, uh, black lines that skip, okay? And the fact that the purple can be inverted with this other notation. And uh, I drew here what you can represent with the EG string instead. Basically, you can represent so far the same stuff because the inversion can be straightforwardly also represented uh, a bit a small uh, observation. What happens if you have, for example, some more, another copy of the same blue here. So this is slightly different color, but I meant to write the same string. What if after, in all sequences, after you have again the same blue, how would you represent this in the two uh, different settings? The genome graph, which is a generic way to mean a graph, a variation graph, string graph, and in the elastic degenerate string. When the genome graph, you would just say, okay, there's again the same blue guy. Then you go back to the tail of this arrow, okay? In the elastic degenerate string, what would you would do is to retype, okay, this blue string again. Uh, somehow, uh, this has some pros and some cons. For example, we have that the genome graph is more compact because it avoids repeating the string. The ED string is more linear. And the linearity is something that Ben Lang made yesterday mentioned as a, a plus with the, for the reason you can, you can guess. Uh, also, another difference is that in this case, in the genome graph, it is acknowledged that there is a repetition because you say, hey, this is the same stuff. I point back to that, which is uniquely represented in the graph, while in the case of ED string, the repetition are hidden. There's no way to see them, okay? But here I come to, uh, I, I quote uh, some words in the work of Benedict Payton and others that says, suggest, and I strongly agree with this, that the repeat homes or the repeated structure of the genome can be investigated somehow in an orthogonal way to other activities uh, using specific uh, data structure that represent it, okay, in an offline manner. While I claim that it's still very interesting to use a representation like the ED string that allow online solution of problems. Uh, my last slide is yet another uh, figure stole from a paper of some colleagues without permission. Actually, also Ben Lang met yesterday at the picture of this particular. This is a particular of uh, the VG graph introduced in 2018. I want to highlight here again another difference with, with ED string, which is not necessarily a weak point of ED string. You see in the VG graph, for example, here you have this degenerate, this variation C or T, and you have explicitly written that C is in the blue or red string while all the other FT. And then you have A in the next position, which is in the blue, red, uh, blah, blah, blah. In the case of ED string, you can represent the same stuff, just writing this uh, degenerate uh, 
positions, okay? But in some sense, you lose information because you lose the information that C is in the blue and red, okay? Which would mean that whenever you have C, you must have A afterwards, okay? And if you go in, in the reason in terms of the string after C, nothing forbids you to put G. So you lose some information, which can lead you to build strings that are artifacts. My claim is that this is not a big issue anyway, because uh, if the goal of the ED string to represent a, G, a pan genome is to represent all possible variation, even if you didn't have in your uh, data set originally, the string which steps on C and then goes down to G, okay? Theoretically, this is a variation that can occur in a population. So if the goal is to describe possible variation, not to take a picture of a specific data set, then it, this can still be, uh, this artifact can be uh, not such a, a, a problem, the drama, okay? So I'm finished, thanks, sorry for the five extra minutes and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Nadia, for uh, your talk. Um, I see there is a question in the um, question and answer, so I start with that. Uh, I read it to you. So thank you, Nadia, great talk. Uh, I often find cited that the read mapping to variation graph is NP complete. I understand this claim stems from the paper by Limasse et al. in uh, 2018, BSA Bioinformatics titled Read Mapping on the De Bruyne Graph. Um, could you comment on why this problem is NP complete and what the difference is uh, for ADSM? Uh, that is, um, why this problem is not NP complete? You know, uh, very simply, the, the last few slides explain that ADSM are a specific case of uh, the general uh, variation graph. There are some constraints, there are some variation that cannot be represented with the it it strings. So it, we, we, the, the, the idea is exactly to, in order to be able to have a linear, in this case, uh, complexity algorithm, we made some uh, simplification assumption that limit the possible variation. So the, we are not NP complete because we are not uh, in the most general case of uh, variation graphs. I hope I answered the, the question. Okay, yeah. uh, let's see if something else come up. Otherwise, in, in the meantime, I have um, a curiosity. You might have said that this at the beginning, I'm sorry if I missed. Um, you have explained how to do pattern matching uh, against an AD string, but how do you get the AD string uh, uh, representation uh, from all the um, set of genomes? Do you simply scan uh, all of them until you have a mismatch and keep the part or you use some like more clever data structure to identify the common part uh, and then build the uh, bracket representation of the ED string? Now, this is a very good question because basically from, from a single multiple sequence alignment, there's not a unique way to be the last of the genus string. You can, uh, have uh, in some cases uh, options, okay? You know, I, um, I cannot explain uh, in, an example, but trust me that the, the same string can, uh, for example, in this one in the variation graph here, you could have CA or CG or TA or TG as a choice, uh, instead of uh, putting two, two position, one is C or T and the other one is A or G. So, but uh, basically we try to investigate the problem of uh, canonical representation of this string. And actually the outcome, uh, which we never published that according to whether your target is to uh, minimize N or minimize big N, uh, you can uh, make a choice uh, rather than another one. But uh, basically there's not a single way. What we used in practice, I have to say, is simply the VCF uh, files, which corresponds to a degenerate, elastic degenerate text. And uh, yeah, how that was built was not our our task. <laughs> we picked uh, as it already. Okay, thank you. And 
Uh, okay, another um, question I had uh, um, was whether you could make uh, some uh, example of uh, application. You men mentioned some uh, RNA related application in your talk. Uh, just uh, I was wondering if you could make, uh, I don't know, another example of whether the ED representation will work well in solving bioinformatic problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the application of RNA was actually for the special, uh, motivated by the fact that we used in that paper, we wanted to uh, find common palindrome substrings. Okay, so we had two degenerate strings and we wanted to find common substrings that were palindromic. A string. So, and the palindrome issue in our mind was uh, relevant in the RNA because it helps to find common substructure of RNA that where the structure is determined by the palindromic, the composition of the string. So that's why we used RNA there. And basically the string was uh, some RNA with possible variations we took from real data. Okay. Thanks. We have another question in the meantime. Um, for ED strings, uh, one would have to make uh, a correct uh, guesses of repeat uh, multiplicity in order to linearize the genome. Yes, the, the, we didn't uh, address this problem. As you could see, we, we saw the ED string as uh, represent any possible linear string you can read, making a choice in the degenerate position. We, did, we don't have multiplicity in the data. We don't take them into account. It would be an interesting, uh, not very complex, I would say, uh, extension to associate a multiplicity to the, to the, to the strings, to the strings uh, where you can choose. Okay. Um, thanks a lot. I think that uh, we have uh, uh, reached the end of uh, this uh, uh, keynote. Uh, um, session. Uh, I thank again uh, uh, Nadia for her uh, talk. I think it's uh, uh, like very interesting also to look at uh, how um, the algorithms and the problems uh, on pattern matching uh, have been improved um, on this kind of representation as uh, in, uh, in others. Uh, it's an aspect that sometimes is uh, not very uh, evident uh, when one use the data structure or use the algorithms uh, that uh, have been done, but there's a lot of work behind that. And I think it was uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, path to the one that you um, show us uh, during, uh, uh, during your talk. So thanks again. Uh, now there's uh, um, a long um, uh, break I share my screen again to let you with the next postcard from this time Botanical Gardens in Padua, uh, UNESCO World Heritage. And um, I'll see you again at uh, 6 p.m. Thanks again to all the speakers for this part of uh, uh, the workshop.